All right, so I, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you also uh, to Roger Hertog for making all this possible. Um, thank you also uh, the uh, Saltzman Institute for co-sponsoring this lecture series um, and the School of International and Public Affairs for providing this venue. Uh, but thank you especially uh, to Graham Allison for coming tonight and talking with us uh, about his work um, to control the spread of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, as many of you know, he's been working on this subject for many years now. Uh, even before then, um, he was working on the problem of, uh, of nuclear weapons um, back when he wrote a classic book called The Essence of Decision. It's a book that I think virtually everybody uh, who studied international affairs in the second half of the 20th century would have, would have read. Uh, it's really a classic study, not just for political scientists, for, for historians as well. Um, but of course, he did more than that. He was the founding dean of the Kennedy School of Government, one of the most influential, if not the most influential public policy schools in the world. Uh, he's the director of the Belfer Center. Um, and in recent years, he's worked especially on this problem of, of nuclear proliferation. Um, you may, many of you, I'm sure, have seen this book, Nuclear Terrorism, the Ultimate Preventable Catastrophe, uh, one of the most influential books that have been produced in this field. But I have to say, it's because of the impact of Graham Allison um, that some people don't worry about this problem as much as they used to. Um, I hope Bob Jervis won't mind if I mention something that he said in, in uh, one of these lectures just a few weeks ago. He said that he used to worry about the problem of loose nukes uh, in the former Soviet Union, but then Graham Allison and a bunch of professors up at Harvard got active about it, um, and they got to be heard um, in the halls of Congress, and they got things done uh, in the non-Luger le legislation, um, which as we all know is an ongoing uh, program that continues to this day. And at least according to Bob Jervis, because of the work of Graham Allison, he doesn't worry about that as much as he did. Um, but I, I think maybe it's fitting then that we have Graham Allison to come here and speak with us tonight about why we should continue to worry about this problem now as before, maybe now more than ever. Um, so let me turn things over to him. Thank you, Graham. So thank you very much for a very generous uh, introduction. And let me say how pleased I am to be here. I actually just came, I was uh, saying to Frank from Washington, where I was today, talking with my uh, colleague, Ash Carter, who's currently the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. And Gallucci and I were talking to him about uh, nuclear attribution and accountability, two great new topics on the agenda for the, the uh, looking at nuclear danger going forward. Namely, how do you f find out whose fingerprints are on the making of the material that would be a bomb that exploded somewhere so that a seller of a bomb or a user of a bomb won't imagine that they could hide behind a cloak of anonymity. And then the more difficult policy question, which is what would constitute accountability or some sense that somebody would be held to account for these purposes. So there are lots and lots of great topics that are open today for students in a way that they had pretty much been all worked over by uh, the latter stages of the Cold War. Post the Cold War and in the new environment, in the nuclear arena, there are lots of questions to which the, con to which the conceptual arsenal hasn't caught up. So I would say uh, great opportunities, and I commend uh, your professors, uh, Frank and Matt, for putting this effort together. For most people, most places, nuclear is a, oh, that was a Cold War. The Cold War's over, move on. Unfortunately, uh, the Cold War, the, the good news is the Cold War's over, and we won yeah, in that sense. But the bad news is that all the things that were made during the Cold War, most of them remain. And in any case, you've by now learned the half-life of uranium and plutonium. So that's a long, long, long time. This is a problem that'll be with us for some time, and there are lots of new questions to be addressed in the domain of nuclear terrorism and nuclear proliferation. And indeed, if you look at the India-Pakistan standoff, even, God forbid, nuclear war. So 
I commend you, the, the uh, Columbia and the professors for putting together such a good program, and I'm happy to be part of it. Let me tell you what I propose to do today. Okay? So this uh, presentation will take about a half hour. It'll come in three parts. First is a quiz. No, no Harvard presentation is complete without a quiz. So you should have got a copy of the quiz in the back. I'm going to give you about two minutes in, in a minute to do the answers, and then you should be able to get the answers to the questions, or you should be able to infer my answers before we're done. Secondly, I'm going to then show you about three minutes of uh, a video clip. Uh, one is, the first is the trailer to a new movie that's going to uh, premiere, I think, here in New York next Friday called Countdown to Zero. It's made by the producer of Inconvenient Truth, the Al Gore movie, who's trying to frame the nuclear challenge. And the movie does, I think, a pretty good job of identifying some aspects of nuclear danger, and then has, uh, I think, a little bit less persuasive conclusion. But still, it's a very interesting movie. I've had a chance to screen it a couple of weeks ago, and I would say it, it engages. The ambition for the uh, producer is that it should be as, uh, uh, it should have as much impact in helping the, the general public get their mind around nuclear danger as uh, Inconvenient Truth did for climate. That's a very high ambition. Okay. Uh, the second is a little clip from a, another documentary that's just being released by the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which is an organization of Sam Nunn, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, George Schultz, and Bill Perry. Uh, and the so-called Four Horsemen, and they've produced a documentary in which they are mainly uh, offering their own best judgments about nuclear danger. So that one's also available, and I think it'll be released very shortly. In any case, it'll be available at nti.org. So the second part of the presentation is three minutes worth of that. Then third, I'm going to take you through some PowerPoint slides fairly quickly that highlight the arguments that are uh, presented in somewhat more detail in the foreign affairs piece, which is back there, which was in January foreign affairs, about the global nuclear order. Some trend lines that I find to be particularly disturbing. Then uh, we'll stop and do questions and discussion. Uh, so that's the plan. If I were to summarize today's presentation uh, in a single uh, sentence, uh, it would be this question number three. Could the global nuclear order be as fragile today as the global financial order was two years ago when conventional wisdom declared it to be sound, stable, and resilient? Now, if you go back uh, through that history, I'd say the beginning of wisdom uh, on the topic of systemic risk is humility. So after the financial crash, many people came forward to say, well, who could not see subprime mortgages? And who could not see the huge leverage at Bear Stearns? Who could not see and who could not see? To which the answer is almost everybody could not see. Okay? Almost everybody. Or if, if uh, before last December, you had heard a presentation that said the euro is at risk because the structure of the euro puts the cart before the horse, namely has a monetary union with no fiscal fed or discipline, and that's fatally flawed. And therefore, it could come unraveled. Prior to the Greece uh, events in December, that would have seemed uh, extreme, very extreme. In fact, most people would have said, yes, of course, there are these structural flaws, but notice the market has upvalued the euro versus the dollar 100% over these nine years. 
But now, after the fact, if you look at the, your, at, the, at the Greek situation and at the impact on the whole question of the viability of the euro and the value of the euro, structural questions appear. So modesty with respect to systemic judgment, nonetheless, my judgment, uh, my best judgment on the answer to this question, could the global nuclear order be fragile, is yes. And that's not an extreme view, and it's not a unique view. So in the video, you'll see Henry Kissinger, who has a same view. Or I'm sure you've been dealing with nuclear spring here. President Obama has same view. That is, he sees the global nuclear order at risk, and the sequence of events that uh, occurred this spring, starting with the Nuclear Posture Review and the Nuclear Security Summit and the NPT Review Conference and the New START are all about trying to bend trend lines that are otherwise undermining this order. So that's in one sentence, could the order be at risk? Let me then proceed, as I suggested, in the three parts. First is the quiz. You get two minutes, okay? So it's a quick quiz, only 10 questions. The answers are either yes, no, or I gave you one multiple choice. Okay. Okay, let me move us on to part two. That was part one. Uh, we'll, you'll get a chance to come back around them. And I say, by, by the time we're done, you'll know my answers to the questions, which not necessarily correct, but they're my answers. And then in the questions and answers, we'll have time to discuss them. So now we're going to part two, which is the videos. The first, as I say, the trailer from this new movie from Bender, the Inconvenient Truth guy called Countdown to Zero. We estimate that there are about 23,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Various groups have been focused on acquiring weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons. All black market seizures that I'm aware of were caught by block. At a Russian naval base in the early 1990s, potatoes were guarded better. Iran, North Korea, they are prepared to start trading nuclear weapons technology. The objective of our data is to quote, kill 4 million Americans. You're not going to get to kill 4 million people by hijacking airplanes and crashing over the buildings. The United States launched a rocket from Norway to study the way lights. We told the Russians that we were going to launch that rocket, but somebody in Moscow forgot to pass the password on it. The Russians actually opened up the command and control launch codes, the button, put it on the desk, and said, we're under attack. Fortunately, Yeltsin wasn't drunk, and he didn't believe what the military was telling him. Hiding his dream is now within the grasp of any country. It doesn't take a Manhattan project to make it a law. We've got to ensure that never once do terrorists succeed in detonating nuclear weapon. All of the forces on launch for the alert could kill over 100 million Russians and Americans within 30 minutes. I stay with conviction. America's commitment to seek a world without nuclear weapons. We will not be men to do away with them in time. The ultimate that was love. Then you better off without it. As we feel. No nuclear weapons. The zero. Zero. Zero nuclear weapons. No way. No way.
And if the existing nuclear countries cannot develop some of these trains among themselves, in other words, if nothing fundamental changes, then I would expect that the use of nuclear weapons in some 10 year period is very possible. So the trailer you can get off of YouTube, and as I say, I think the movie premieres next weekend, and the documentary, uh, I would check out nti.org. Uh, and I don't know exactly when it's going to be released. Thank you. Good. Okay, so uh, how to think about uh, a risk that's low probability or uncertain probability but catastrophic consequences. In the Cold War, we came to have a, a little uh, whatever, maxim, that said risk equals probability times consequences. So if the consequences are genuinely catastrophic, a very low probability of uh, such an event makes it something that has to be riveting. And in the case of the Cold War, the fear was a general nuclear war that, in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, might have killed 100 million people in a, in, a, in a brief span, and that at the height of the Cold War might have succeeded in actually erasing the U.S. and the Soviet Union from the map. And in the case of nuclear winter, one of the possible scenarios, maybe even succeeding in killing everybody. So if the consequences are so huge, what's the difference between a 1% chance of such a consequence and a 10% chance in terms of what you should do? And the answer is not much. That is, you should do everything conceivable to avoid such consequences. Now, how likely is a nuclear terrorist attack? That's, I know, one of the topics you'll be considering in the course. In, in uh, nuclear terrorism, the book that Matt mentioned, uh, I offered my view, this is back in 2004, that on the current trend lines, the likelihood was greater than even, that is 50% plus, within a decade, that I get you to the end of 2014. The commission that Congress established as a successor to the 9-11 Commission called the Commission on WMD Terrorism and Proliferation. Nine Americans, five uh, Democrats, four Republicans, chaired by Bob Graham and Jim Talent, two former senators, offered its view, and this was now in December of 2008, that again, on the current trend lines, the likelihood of a nuclear or biological terrorist, successful terrorist attack somewhere in the world in the next five years, well, that's by the end of 13, is greater than even. Now you think, well, whoa, how, do we, how, how does one even try to think about this? How likely was 9-11? If you go back through all the arguments that were made before 9-11 about why something like that couldn't happen, well, it had never happened before. So that's a good reason for thinking it couldn't happen, yeah? Or it would be too hard or go down the list. As Condi Rice testified to the 9-11 Commission, he said no one could have imagined terrorists hijacking airplanes and crashing them into buildings. And what was the principal conclusion of the 9-11 Commission? The principal conclusion was that the US government suffered from a 
quote, failure of imagination. Because when you say something is unimaginable, or even inconceivable, note, that's not a statement about the world. That's a statement about your ability to conceive or to imagine. So what I'm going to try to do now is to get us to try to imagine something that may seem far-fetched, even unimaginable, namely an unraveling of elements of the global nuclear order to a conclusion that could mean a bomb exploding, devastating the heart of one of our great cities somewhere in the world, or indeed even a regional nuclear war and the spread of nuclear weapons. So that's the, uh, that's the plan. So what's the single uh, greatest threat to U.S. national security, short term, medium term, and long term? I probably wouldn't have put such a bold statement. But President Obama says, short term, medium term, and long term. I don't think it's worth arguing uh, for a long time whether the rise of China might be an equivalent threat over the medium term or the long term. But I would say nuclear terrorism is a category one threat. Mohamed Baraday uh, was the director of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, nuclear terrorism is the most serious danger the world is facing. So this is not just an American point of view. Back in 2005, Kofi Annan impaneled a group called, a, it was a commission on 21st century threats, challenges, and change. We were asked to look at the next 25 years and identify the most important challenges globally. They identified six challenges, of which one was climate disruption, one was global poverty, one was uh, pandemics. They gave pride a place to nuclear, among those, nuclear danger. And they say, and this is a very, I think, telling quote, we're approaching a point at which the erosion of the non-proliferation regime, that's the NPT and the rest of the associated uh, elements of the order that have held back the spread of nuclear weapons, is eroding to the point that it could become irreversible, after which would be a cascade of proliferation. And I'll have more to say about that. Okay, what about these trend lines? In the foreign affairs piece, I offer 10 trend lines that are powerfully propelled, that are, I say, and I think if you look at the analysis of it, eroding what has been the stuff of the global nuclear order. One of these is the emergence of nuclear black marketeers, or what uh, Alberti called the Walmart of private sector proliferation. Now, who was Mr. A.Q. Khan? He was the father of the Pakistani nuclear bomb program. So he's a hero in Pakistan for having organized the effort that built Pakistan's nuclear bomb. How did he do this? Well, he worked originally at Urinco. Uh, he stole uh, from Urinco the technology for making centrifuges. He then went to Pakistan and developed a very effective network for buying things in the black market and the gray market for putting together a program. And then over a period of more than a decade, he built with a, a number of associates, but he is the recognized father, the Pakistani nuclear bomb and the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. At some stage, since he had learned how black markets work in this process, because he needed to be in them to do buys, it occurred to him that perhaps he could do sells as well. And maybe, why couldn't he keep a good part of the money himself? Now, it's still not unraveled entirely how much, how, who else in Pakistan knew about what was going on. But in fact, he, A.Q. Khan, developed a very effective, impressive, global sourcing uh, network from which he would have pieces for the centrifuges made in Malaysia. He ran his money out of Switzerland. 
He ran some of, the, some of the transfer of materials in Dubai. He got a number of pieces of equipment from Europe. So he had a global sourcing process. And who, who were buyers? Well, North Korea, a lot of stuff was traded. Iran, he visited often. Libya is the case that we know best. Because after 2003, when the Libyans were caught, Gaddafi decided to confess and basically to invite the US and the British in to see what he had bought and what he was doing. And the reason why this material is very well understood is that it is now in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So American intelligence agents and British intelligence agents went, collected all this stuff, went through the track record of how and where it had come from and otherwise. Here on the left are UF-6 containers. UF-6 is starter fuel for a nuclear bomb. So you take this UF-6, the amount that he's got there, you run him through the centrifuges, and you'll have enough for your first nuclear bomb. The middle, middle box is the centrifuges. These are the devices that enrich uranium, starting with UF-6. And then third, very interesting here, is a nuclear warhead design which is not a crude nuclear bomb. Not a crude nuclear bomb. This is a design for a very advanced nuclear bomb that Pakistan had got from China, which then AQ Khan privately sold. And this design for a bomb then appeared in a, on, a, on a computer, which then was captured uh, in Europe. But if it was on a computer, who knows to whom other addresses it was sent. North Korea. Another trend line undermining the global nuclear order is the fact that one of the poorest, weakest, smallest, most isolated states on Earth has successfully violated the rules of the regime and the direct demands from the gamekeepers namely the U.S., the so-called sole superpower, and China, their neighbor, and has proceeded methodically to produce what's now 10 bombs worth of plutonium and conduct two nuclear weapons tests. So here's Mr. Kim Jong-il, a very strange character, a person who's, I think, demonstrated a capacity for risk-taking and for uh, boldness that really is breathtaking, breathtaking. So what has he done? He's taken North Korea, this Yongbong reactor, produced after, fr from the spent fuel, 10 bombs worth of plutonium, conducted two nuclear tests, has developed a fairly impressive missile program, and of course, this is only for his own arsenal. And with this, he would not do anything else that would be dangerous. You might hope, but you'd be wrong. For many, many years, North Korea was known as, quote, missiles or us. You've got money, we got missiles. They've delivered missiles actually as late as 2006 uh, uh, to Iran. But who could imagine that North Korea would think that it could sell to Syria a Yonbong style reactor, get paid for it, and get away with it? If I had made that as a hypothetical prior to the event, I think uh, you would have said, oh, that's just much, much, much too far-fetched. I didn't believe he would do that, okay? It's just too big, too visible. Sir, excuse me, this is right next door to Israel and right next door to Iraq, where we're operating. In any case, without question, Kim Jong-il sold to Syria this yongbong style reactor, which was there and about to start operating, until it was bombed by Israel and therefore eliminated. But from Kim Jong-il's point of view, so what about this? 
I made a sale. I got paid. The Syrians uh, took the consequences. At least now people know I'm in business. And what else happened to North Korea? Within six months, the U.S. was back at the six-party talks, talking to them. Hmm? Iran. I know that in the course you've dealt with Iran and you can't uh, uh, not uh, see Iran all over the newspapers, including this latest, uh, most interesting episode with the uh, defector, <laughs> double agent, redefector, spy, wh whoever and whatever he was. But in any case, you know about Mr. Ahmadinejad. So he's got this facility at Natanz where he produces UF-6. Sorry, at, at East Fahan. He then brings it to Natanz, which is his uh, enrichment facility. At the enrichment facility, since 2006, Iran has produced now more than 4,500 pounds of low enriched uranium, which is more than enough after further enrichment for their first two nuclear bombs. Has mastered the technology of enrichment has actually been working on some third generation centrifuges, which we've seen in R&D form, but not in operation, and was building a, a, a covert facility at Quom until that was outed by President Obama and uh, Sarkozy and, uh, and Brown back last September or October. So Iran, has uh, been subject to how many rounds of UN Security Council resolutions that demanded that enrichment and the taunts cease? Four. To sanctions on how many occasions? Five. And what impact has this had on the trend line of their mastery of technology for enrichment and their accumulation of low enriched uranium, and indeed now the processing of some, some further enrichment to medium enriched uranium? The answer is very little, very little. India and Pakistan. Another trend line undermining the order has been the increased numbers and roles of nuclear weapons in the arsenals of some of the new nuclear weapon states, in particular, India and Pakistan. So if you remember back in 1998, they both came out of the basement with tests. Since 2001, the Pakistani nuclear arsenal has approximately tripled, approximately tripled. Both India and Pakistan are on rapid buildup of arsenals currently. And in both countries, but especially Pakistan, nuclear weapons are part of the active arsenal and plans for strategy and defense. So I noticed, I think when I was on the plane coming, that uh, you're going to read an IS article by uh, Vipping uh, Narayan. He's got a very good account of uh, Pakistan's development of a, of, a, of a concept that they call asymmetric deterrence. We're behind a nuclear shield, that is, the threat to engage in a nuclear war. They think they can conduct operations like the operation at Mumbai. So here's the, the lineup. A state that's fighting two insurgencies, the Taliban, Afghan, and the Taliban pack, where Al Qaeda's leadership has moved in ungoverned territories, where the connections between Pakistani security services and terrorist groups or groups that have terrorist components, like LET, is quite thick. And where then we see, if you remember back in 2008 at the Taj Hotel in Mumbai, 
LET operatives conducting an attack in India at the hotel that ended up killing almost 200 people behind a shield of nuclear weapons. India has so far been deterred, but the Indian military regards this as an unacceptable set of circumstances. And if you try to think about it, I was in India in January talking to their national security advisor. And I said, I can't imagine how you all are as reserved as you are. If a Mexican uh, related terrorist group came to the Waldorf and killed 200 people, what would the U.S. do? So I would say if, if, if there's a, a nuclear war between two states in the next decade, it's pretty clear who the candidates are. And I'd say the situation is extremely volatile. So Al-Qaeda. Uh, I don't need to remind you in New York about 9-11, but the proposition that Al-Qaeda is not seriously seeking nuclear weapons is a proposition that the evidence absolutely refutes. Absolutely refutes. And if you want the most compelling account of that, one of the people shown in the movie was Rolf Mowat Larson. He was the U.S. government's best intelligence agent working on this problem for the last decade. He's now come to the Belfer Center at Harvard when he retired. And he's produced a chronology of Al-Qaeda's search for nuclear bombs an unclassified chronology. You can get it at the Belfer website, just belfer.org or belfercenter.org at the Kennedy School. Uh, so they've clearly made three buys in which they got cheated. They've clearly bought some stuff. At a point when uh, Osama had got frustrated by the fact that they were not succeeding, he got two key scientists from AQ Khan's Pakistani establishment to come visit him in Afghanistan. This is when he's still there. And this design of a bomb is from one of these, a fellow uh, uh, who actually was, that may look like a cartoon. That's not a bad design. Not a bad design for a version of a gun type uh, bomb. So I put over here on the right Dragonfire's bomb And I'll say a word about that maybe just in a minute. So <coughs> how to think about uh, the risks here? One thing is to work the analytics yourself. So I would say do that. The other thing is to say, what do the people who shouldered responsibility for a problem and had uh, access to evidence that you and I wouldn't have on an unclassified basis, what do they conclude? So. As uh, Bob Gates, our Secretary of Defense, says, everybody uh, uh, you know, has their nightmares from time to time. But when he wakes up in the middle of the night, the one that he's worried about is terrorists with a nuclear bomb. George Tenet, who became very seized of this issue after 9-11, uh, offers the view, which is a consensus view at the CIA, which is nuclear weapons is where Al-Qaeda desperately wants to go. And Jim Jones, same. Okay, here's Dragonfire's bomb here in New York. Uh, Dragonfire, uh, that story I tell in the introduction to the nuclear terrorism book. Uh, Dragonfire a uh, is a, was a source for US intelligence who was reporting a month after 9-11 that Al-Qaeda had got a small nuclear bomb out of the former Soviet arsenal and now had it in New York City about to explode. As I tell in the book, there was then a, uh, a bit of breathtaking and an interrogatory between Bush and uh, Tenet, who was then director of CIA. First, uh, did the former Soviet arsenal include bombs of the description that Dragonfire had given? Answer, yes. Second, were all these bombs adequately accounted for? Answer, no. 
Could Al-Qaeda have got one of these bombs and brought it to New York City and be about to explode it and we not otherwise know anything about it? Answer, yes. So the bottom line from this interrogatory was no basis for dismissing Dragonfire's report that there was now a live bomb in New York City about to explode. On this basis, Bush ordered Cheney to leave Washington because if there was a bomb in New York, there might as well be one in Washington. If you remember after 9-11, for many months, Cheney was often said to be missing, or off in his cave or otherwise. Okay? Actually, he was part of the continuity of government program that we had during the Cold War. Several thousand people from the U.S. government, different agencies, also moved out of Washington to this alternative site. In the case that a bomb went off in Washington, we still want to survive as a society. We still want to have a government. NIST teams, who were the nuclear experts, were sent to New York to look for evidence of the bomb, to try to find it. Uh, it turned out to be a false alarm, so that's the good news. But the bad news is this could have been happening. And if it had happened, I imagine that this nuclear bomb, the bomb would have been smaller than this podium. So a tactical nuclear weapon, quite small. Put it in the back of an SUV, drive it into Times Square, blow it up on a work day. Everything in the red zone disappears instantaneously just uh, vanishes, uh, consumed by this ball of fire that's released and this release of energy. And everything out to the blue zone, you can see, goes to the, uh, to the tunnels and the bridges. Uh, looks like the federal office building in Oklahoma City after a homegrown American terrorist bombed it back in, in 1996. So a half million people could die instantaneously or in the first hour. And another few hundred thousand in the in the, day, in the week that followed from radiation poisoning and otherwise. So if you want more, quote, best judgments uh, with respect to how serious this issue is, uh, here's a few more. That's uh, once over lightly. So to conclude, uh, could the global nuclear order be as fragile as the financial order? In my view, yes. Uh, why? Not because people are not working harder to try to make it more secure, but because trend lines powerful trend lines, are running in the opposite direction. So in a sense, we have to run faster to stay in place. It's like you were running, trying to run up an escalator that's going down. And what are these trend lines? Well, as I say, I give you more in a systematic fashion, 10 of them in the foreign affairs piece. But they include a North Korea that's defied the regime, an Iran that proceeds in spite of UN Security Council resolutions, an India-Pakistan dynamic that both is increasing substantially their amount of nuclear weapons and materials and also in a standoff that's volatile. And then the surround, which is the risk that if and as North Korea becomes a nuclear weapon state and if and as Iran becomes a nuclear weapon state, you'll get a knock-on effect that will produce a further spread of nuclear weapons. And all the while, we've got Al-Qaeda as one example, which has been seriously seeking nuclear weapons or the material from which they can make a bomb. And if they were to succeed today, the first thing we might know about it is when it occurred. So at the, at the end of the, of the picture for Al-Qaeda, in, if you try to study them, as I've been trying to do, if, where their MO is devastating, uh, deadly, and theatrical, it is a mushroom cloud enveloping a city. And even though I, uh, I don't want to make uh, you know, uh, light of the fact that we're in New York, I would say in Al-Qaeda's MO, 
they pick their targets and go back after them. So among American cities, I would say Washington and New York you know, are, are at the top of their list. So maybe that's enough to say uh, uh, that's the bad news. The good news, let me just say one final thing. Uh, in the nuclear terrorism book, the subtitle is called The Ultimate Preventable Catastrophe. So underline preventable. And there I try to outline an agenda of action and a strategy that if undertaken, if undertaken, would successfully reduce the likelihood of a nuclear terrorist attack to nearly zero. And some of those actions we're not taking, some we're not taking fast enough, and we're working against very powerful trend lines. But maybe I'll talk about that in the questions and answers if people are interested. So I'm happy to go off in any or all directions. So I would ask those who'd like to pose questions to come up to the microphone in the middle of the room. Chris. Thank you for the presentation, Professor. Uh, my name is Christopher Brownfield. I'm a participant in the Hertog Global Strategy Initiative. And I noticed here that on, on this sheet saying nuclear terrorism, the ultimate preventable catastrophe, you have uh, no, nuclear, no new nuclear weapon states, basically to draw a line in the sand with the eight existing nuclear powers. Um, <laughs> The problem that I see with that is that some of these powers, India, Pakistan, and Israel, are not legitimized within our current regime complex for non-proliferation and control of nuclear materials. Uh, what ways do you see for us to, for the world, to provide some sort of legitimacy for these powers and bring them into the fold so that we're participating and collaborating with them as legitimate uh, partners on the same level? It's a very good question. Let me first clarify, and then I'll try to get to the point of the question. Uh, the proposition about no new nuclear weapon states is not to legitimize and grandfather the current states forever. Actually, I think the debate about uh, the embrace of the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons, the proposition that's been put by the four horsemen and has been endorsed by President Obama, is a very interesting debate. And I would wish and pray for a world in which there were no nuclear weapons. I would say that's an appropriate objective or aspiration, even though I have an extremely difficult time figuring out how, given where we are, we get from here to there. But, so it's not to legitimize these others forever. It's to stop further bleeding, and then we go back and work on the other problems, or, or at least first things first. But with respect to your specific question of uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, who are not nuclear weapon states in the non-proliferation treaty uh, where, as you I'm sure studied, there were five halves that were agreed to be able to continue having for a while, even though Article 6 commits them to negotiate in good faith towards the ultimate elimination of these arsenals. So uh, could one uh, uh, imagine amending the NPT to allow these three in and say, well, then we're really going to shut the door no more. Given the fact that it's a consensus uh, group, the answer is no. If you, if you all saw the, the NPT review conference here in, uh, in New York in May, uh, I mean, it's hard enough to get an agreement on anything. And so you certainly wouldn't get an agreement on anything that would be hard or difficult. So what are other alternatives? One that I'm attracted to and that I've advocated would be to create, uh, in addition to the NPT, because the, 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 the nuclear order or regime is not only the NPT, that's the centerpiece, but there's the nuclear suppliers group, and there's the Australia group, and there's the proliferation security initiative. There's a lot of surround, okay? I would like for there to be a, what I've called a global alliance against nuclear terrorism that I would feature as an alliance. I think the founding members should be the US and Russia as the states that have the largest arsenals. But it should be open to all states who will commit to uh, the mission would be doing everything feasible on the fastest possible timetable to uh, reduce to the lowest level the risk of nuclear terrorism. 
And the elements of that would then include, I've got, you know, there's four or five elements, but the crux of it would be first a principle of nuclear security in which all nuclear weapons and all nuclear materials would be secured to a gold standard that is as good as gold in Fort Knox and would be done in a manner sufficiently transparent that one state could believe that the other state had done it. So that's the principle of assured nuclear security. And then the second principle would be nuclear accountability in which if you made it, you're going to be held accountable in a strict liability sense for what happens to it. So if God forbid a nuclear weapon or material, nuclear weapon usable material is stolen by an inside crook and sold to a terrorist and used, if you made the bomb, you're responsible for the bomb. And then figuring out exactly what means responsible and accountable, that's another part of the, you know, but, but it's a good question. And I, I think that the fact that these three states are left hanging out there in some sense it is a problem for the regime. Hi, I'm James Hamilton from King's College. I think you just answered the last part of my question. But um, my first, first part is, uh, do you see the current uh, nuclear security instruments as ineffective entirely, or are there some elements that you'd keep in your global alliance as well? I, I, I do not see them as, uh, as, I mean, I do not think we should be about junking anything that we have. In fact, if you said, how has the NPT worked? Oh, again, just a short history. I don't know how much you all have done this already in the course. But the, when, the, uh, when Kennedy was president, he made his famous forecast. This is 1962, 1963, that on the current trend lines, by the end of 1970s, there'd be 25 nuclear weapon states. And nobody said that's an exaggeration. You go back and look at the coverage of it. Now, why? Because it was assumed that as states acquired the technical capability to build bombs, they would do so, just like the other guys did. In fact, this is another one of the questions down here, how many states actually started down that road and then after the NPT stopped and reversed course? The answer is 13 at least. So Sweden had a serious nuclear weapons program. Italy had a serious nuclear weapons program. South Korea had a serious nuclear weapons program. Brazil had a serious nuclear weapons program. So a huge number of states were going down there in reverse. So that with respect to the NPT, I would say a treaty that got you 184, don't mess with it, okay? Yes, it's unraveling, but don't. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to, I, wouldn't, I don't think I would jettison any part of the system while I'm working on you know, trying to restructure it, but maybe I didn't get the... I, mean, I meant to add on the end of that, in terms of preventing nuclear terrorism. Well, I think in terms of preventing nuclear terrorism, if, if, uh, if God forbid, uh, Iran becomes uh, a nuclear weapon state, and now you see a rush among other countries, and I would say Saudi looks at the top of the list, as a buyer, not a maker, and Egypt is certainly interested, but challenged. Turkey will be an interesting case. Syria, already looking uh, uh, previously. So if you're building, do, have people building, or trying to build their own arsenals, enriching uranium, as is happening in Iran today, or is happening in, uh, um, in Pakistan, you're producing more material, that material is available to be stolen by somebody and to be transferred. You've got more potential AQ cons. So stopping the proliferation piece of this is, I think, a significant part of stopping, pro stopping nuclear terrorism down, down the path. So I would, I would keep all of the elements, but I think it needs a lot more. And if you ask, if you go back to the uh, nuclear security summit that President Obama had in April, this was a most extraordinary event. Again, I don't know if you all have, uh, have dealt with it, but uh, this was the largest gathering of heads of state at the invitation of an American president since FDR invited uh, uh, people to San Francisco for what created the UN. So this was a big deal, 46 heads of state. 
And out of it came a verbal commitment to lock down all nuclear weapons and materials everywhere as good as gold within four years. Now that's the good news, okay, that there's a declaratory commitment. The bad news is there was no operational definition of what means you in 1540 and as good as gold. We couldn't get agreement on that. And there was no agreement on what would constitute appropriate transparency so that you would have some reason to believe that I did it other than that I told you. So I think there's a, a good start, but a huge amount of, to, to be done. Thank you for speaking to us today. My name is Jermaine, and I'm from Georgetown University. Um, my question is, um, a lot of effort is being focused on nuclear non-proliferation and counterterrorism, and I'm afraid it's at the expense of nuclear disarmament. Nuclear? Disarmament. Um, what I'm thinking is that um, how you define a problem pretty much determines how you solve that problem. In this case, the way this problem is being defined is that nuclear weapons in the hands of the wrong people. Well, I think that the real problem is the nuclear weapons themselves and not the weapons getting into the hands of the wrong people. And so um, my question to you is that what are the obstacles to actually sitting down and talking seriously about disarmament rather than non-proliferation and counterterrorism? Because if you don't have the weapons, then you don't have to worry about the weapons getting into the wrong hands. Okay. It's a very good question, and it, it, it's the, it's the uh, I guess, the tip of an iceberg of an even bigger question. So the NPT, this bargain, commits the nuclear weapon states to disarmament. So that's no question about this. You look at the treaty, read it carefully, look at the, look at the history. So what was said, the deal was, and this was 1968 and then into force in 1970, is I have nuclear weapons, you agree not to have nuclear weapons, but I agree that nuclear weapons are not good for me either, and I agree to enter into serious negotiations towards the ultimate elimination. So that's the, the, the theory of the case. Now then you have the Cold War. So at the peak of the Cold War, how many, how many nuclear warheads were there in the world? 68,000. How grotesque is that? I mean, if you want to get a, you want to, in fact, if you're doing your history part, if you want a kind of a good, good bookmark, go back and look at Herman Kahn's book on thermonuclear war, which was, a, was taken to be a very uh, hawkish book. He says, if anybody ever had a thousand weapons, that would be insane. He says that, that, that might actually threaten to kill everybody. And citizens, if they understood it, wouldn't allow that. Okay, so in any case, we had 68,000. Now, since 1991, the end of the Cold War, actually both the U.S. and the Russian arsenal have been on a very sharp down, down slope. So now it's about 2,300, approximately. I'm sorry, 23,000. But in the New START Treaty, the agreement is to get down to 1,550 uh, active nuclear, arsenal, nuclear weapons on both sides. So you're moving certainly in the right direction, not as fast as you would like or as I would like, and not as much as we should, but in any case, moving in the right direction. Now, what then are the long-term obstacles here? Well, I would say there are three big, big problems as you try to think about the vision of zero. Okay? So one obstacle is I can't disinvent nuclear weapons. So if we took all the nuclear weapons in the world today and eliminate them, what about if somebody just builds them over again? So I need some situation to make it, you believe that I'm not in the closet, you know, building the arsenal over. So that's number one. Number two, what about cheating? Why don't I just save a few nuclear weapons on the side, just in case, for a rainy day? So the level of an intrusive inspection that you would need to believe that there were not 100 nuclear weapons squirreled away somewhere in the US or in Russia would be difficult. Not impossible, so we're just understanding the, the challenges. And then, uh, well maybe that's enough to, to, uh, to see why it's hard. 
That doesn't mean that it needs to be given up. And I think in the dynamic, the non-nuclear weapon states, and so if you had been at the NPT review conference, you would have heard this over and over and over. People say, hey, we made a deal. We would not get nuclear weapons, and you would negotiate seriously about eliminating your weapons. And we're still not having any weapons, and what are you doing? Okay. So that, that dynamic, I don't think it's I, I, frequent for, it, for some of the non-proliferation pros, it's more of a rhetorical excuse. But I think, in fact, in the dynamic, uh, delegitimizing nuclear weapons for everybody is a good part of the process of having an impact on other states deciding they don't want to build nuclear weapons. My colleague, Hassan. Hi. Uh, I'm Hassan Abbas. Um, I hold Qaeda Azam Chair in Pakistan Studies at SEPA and South Asia Institute, and I'm proud to be associated with Belfer Center. Uh, my question, I have a two-part question. One is, um, if you can say something more about all what this means for U.S. policy towards Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Because as you have very um, rightly pointed out, uh, that all these things are centered within Pakistan, Afghanistan, in, in many ways. Uh, what that implies for U.S. policy, whether more engagement with Pakistan or more engagement with military, more engagement in um, bringing Pakistan and India together, a longer-term perspective, uh, perspective about Afghanistan or not, what do you say about that? And a link, linked question is that in terms of the preventable aspects of, of your theory, um, how do you rate the performance of this present administration? Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is, these are two different questions, you, as you say. And uh, so, Hassan, I uh, say that you guys at Columbia have got uh, a good, good fortune in having him here as a colleague. Hassan, when he was a Pakistani uh, policeman, was a key person in tracking down the AQ Khan story inside Pakistan. So uh, he's a big part of the source of information about the way this whole, whole uh, matter unraveled. I think your first question on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India is just right. And I, I think that uh, when a President Obama did this review of our policy towards Afghanistan in you know, the period from January to, to April, and then made his announcement at West Point of an additional 30,000 troops for Afghanistan, basically what we did was take a you know, take a magnifying glass and look at Afghanistan. Now, of course, you have to look at Afghanistan because uh, there's already, uh, before the 30,000, 70,000 Americans fighting there, and it was the place where Al-Qaeda was when the attack occurred, so there was no way you're not going to look at it. But we looked at it, and or it seems to me that the review process looked at it. And if you asked about the region, you would say, what vital interests, in, in my thinking, does the U.S. have in Afghanistan? Or to put it another way, suppose Al-Qaeda hadn't been in Afghanistan. They'd been in Sudan, where they were before, until they got kicked out, when the attack on 9-11 occurred. Is there any, would we be saying, oh, 100,000 troops and $100 billion a year for Afghanistan is the solution? No, I would say that we would, Afghanistan would look like Somalia or Yemen or many other horrible situations in the world, but not ones that we think the solution to is uh, 100,000 American troops and $100 billion a year for a long-term project. So I think that by focusing on the problem that was the urgent, we might not have taken enough account of the important. So if I were looking at the region, I would, my, my, my magnifying glass would start with Pakistan. Why? Okay. Well, you know better than I do. I mean, Pakistan is this cauldron in some sense. So it's a country severely challenged, as I mentioned before, by two serious insurgencies. Al-Qaeda headquarters, so terrorists, uh, a uh, confrontation with a much larger, almost whatever, seven, eight times larger 
uh, adversary with whom it's fought three wars and almost another or two, uh, with a fragile political system. I mean, this is a comp- this is a problem. And back to our Q and A's here, in the Commission on uh, Preventing, or sorry, the the uh, this Congressional Commission Commission I mentioned on uh, preventing WMD proliferation and terrorism. It says, quote, if you map terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, all roads intersect in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So I would say there are huge, vital national interests in Pakistan. So I would look first at Pakistan. And if I say my next question, well, what nation has the biggest impact on Pakistan? You know a lot better than I do, but I don't think it's Afghanistan. I don't think it's things emanating from Afghanistan. I think it's India. Well, but we have an emissary who looks at Afghanistan, Holbrook, and at Pakistan he can look at. But he's not allowed to say the word India other than to say, I don't know anything about India. India is not my problem. India is not my purview. India doesn't really have all that much impact on Pakistan. I mean, I had him up in, in Harvard for a forum event this spring, and he, he said, I'm obliged to say, India has no impact on Pakistan. I said, how, how can you say this? He said, I'm obliged to say, this is okay. So that's what he says, not true, okay. So how then to think about India and Pakistan interaction? Again, extremely difficult, and you know better than I do, but if you have, Countries that have fought three wars, have come to the edge of a couple of additional wars, have a territorial dispute that seems vital to each of them. Uh, this is a, it's a powder cake. And it could, many different things could, could, uh, could, uh, could, could, could set it off. So the idea that then both of these countries are rapidly expanding their stockpile of nuclear weapons usable material, which India is doing in part as a result of the U.S.-Indian agreement, makes no sense to me. And the fact that Pakistan is expanding its arsenal of material makes, makes no sense to me. So I, I would say that's a, you put your finger on a, on a tough, tough set of problems. And that is not, I'm describing the problems more than the solutions, because I think the solutions are you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. I don't know of any grand solution to the, to the issue. On Obama and the Obama administration, I would say for, for identifying the issue of nuclear danger, including nuclear terrorism and nuclear proliferation, I would give Obama an A. If you imagine a president that comes to office in January of 09, you're in the midst of a financial crisis that's just about to become a Great Depression, and he says, I can think of something even worse. You know, how, who would do this? Okay. I mean, only a strange character. Okay. So I would say, wonderful to have a president that has his head around the, the subject. His, his coordinates with respect to the issue seem to me to be right. Again, if you take it, when he came here in September for the UN uh, General Assembly you know, parade of, uh, of heads of state, it just happened by accident that the uh, U.S. was uh, chair of the, Secur- of the Security Council. So he said, I'll, I'll chair the Security Council because I'm going to be there that day. And then the chair gets to set the agenda. So he said, uh, we're going to talk about nuclear terrorism. He said, what? You don't know there's a financial crisis? Everybody wants to talk about a financial crisis. And there's going to be Copenhagen with climate disruption. We should talk about that. He said, I'm the chairman. We're talking about nuclear terrorism. So that was the subject for, the, for his session. And this nuclear security summit I already mentioned. So I would say for, for identifying the problems and trying to work on them, high marks. Where I would say there's a big question mark, and a big question mark, is in the mounting of a strategy and operational plan that leads to the actions that would be required to bend these trend lines. And you mentioned India and Pakistan. That's one extremely good example. But I would say if you look at North Korea, 
It's about the same. Iran, about the same, you know, in terms of the trend line. So these trend lines haven't bent okay. yet. And I would say the, the strategy and plan of action for bending them, if I'm just looking at it on the record at this point, is not, not yet been successful. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to associate a face with all the reading I've done of yours for the past 30 years. Uh, I attended a conference at Stanford in 98-99 that David Holloway organized specifically on the question of proliferation. How do you deactivate the nuclear arsenal of the former Soviet Union? And an image that still sticks in my mind is sort of like of a farmhouse in rural Pennsylvania that was the shot in Murmansk where they stored nuclear weapons. And the whole uh, object there was, well, what's going on? And even at that conference, people from the military, from DIA, were talking about that there were weapons already missing, which was quite disturbing to listen to. So my question is, in the sheets you give, you talk about all these incidents that have happened in recent years. Where are we at on the issue of securing these weapons? And secondly, when you think of the Cassis Belli for the war in Iraq, certainly the issue of WMD was thrown in our face, mm -hmm. thrown in the world's face. And as we know, the outcome of that is questionable to say the least. So how can we review these conflicts or possible use of preemptive military force with that kind of background to the public being dubious of claims of WMD being put forth as a rationale to go to war? Whoa, two wonderful questions and huge questions. So let me just skim the surface on, on uh, both of them. Uh, as was said in the introduction, I've been extremely interested in this question for a long time. Okay. And uh, when, uh, after Nunn Luger, uh, which was in the end of 91, then when Clinton was elected, uh, I became Secretary, Assistant Secretary of Defense and my colleague Ash also. Uh, and we had just written a book called Cooperative Denuclearization. So we came with a little game plan and had the opportunity to try to help put some of these things into, uh, into motion. In 1991, December, uh, Dick Cheney was on Meet the Press. Now, this is good to remember and you can look it up, okay. Uh, he was Secretary of Defense for Papa Bush. And he's asked, and I, this is an epigraph for the chapter uh, where uh, in nuclear terrorism, he's asked, uh, if, the, if the Soviet Union should disappear or should collapse, what's going to happen to, this 20, to these nuclear weapons? I mean, could some of them come loose? And he says, and it's a quote, he says, uh, well, let's say they have 25,000 weapons. If they're 99% effective, then there'll only be 250 weapons, you know, loose. And then he says, and with the chaos that, you know, would be with the collapse of a state, FedEx would have a trouble, you know, with doing better than that. Now, where are those 250 weapons? I've searched for them every day almost, okay? And if tomorrow we find one, I wouldn't be shocked, okay? So one of the most amazing things to me about the last almost 19 years is not one single nuclear weapon from the former Soviet arsenal has been found loose out. Okay? Not one. Material, yes, okay, but a bomb, an actual nuclear weapon. How to account for that? I would say first, most important, uh, extreme professionalism by the former Soviets and Russians, especially in the 12th Duma. I mean, that's extra human. Your, your country collapses, there's total corruption everywhere, there's chaos, and you don't pick up a few weapons and become rich? I mean, I, when I give this presentation to Russians, I say, thank God the 12th Guma was not consisted of investment bankers okay, who were taught to monetize their assets. Okay. So in any case, it's big. Nun Luger and the US cooperation has been a big piece of it. But then there's a huge portion of just grace or good fortune or good luck, okay, for so far. So I wouldn't take any of that for granted. But in any case, the fact that some, that a strategy was developed, some things were done, I think the result of it at this stage is 
the level of security of nuclear weapons and materials in Russia is hugely better than it was in 1991, though the 12th Gumo was probably more professional in 1991 than it is today because Russia's become an even more corrupt society, unfortunately. So that'd be on the Russian piece. On other, other countries, I would say uh, um, Pakistan, uh, complicated uh, story, particularly as the material uh, expands. Uh, India, as the material expands, complicated story. South Africa is a good case. Uh, that if you look at Pilindabo, uh, there's 30 bombs worth of material. South Africa is the only country that built nuclear weapons itself and then eliminated itself. But the material for those weapons, about 30 bombs worth of stuff, is still kept at a place in Pilindabo where if you look at, if you can uh, YouTube it or something, uh, uh, 60 Minutes did a very good program on the fact that two independent, two, two groups of more than four armed people penetrated Pilandabo simultaneously, shot a guard, stole some stuff. This is back in 2000 and whatever, eight. So there's a lot of places that are still not, not, not well secured. And Obama's objective of all weapons, all materials to gold standard in four years is a good, it seems to be a good objective, but very ambitious, very ambitious. On your second question, it's certainly right that among the terrible tragedies of Iraq, as far as I'm concerned, was that, was kind of the opportunity cost. That basically we played the card of uh, Iraqi WMD, including even uh, wild, and I would say wild, statements about a nuclear program in Iraq, when that was not the view of the intelligence community, that was not the view of the IAEA. Chemical and biological weapons, yes. That was thought to be in Iraq, but nuclear, no, no. In any case, turn out that having gone to war on a false premise, uh, going now to the next party and saying, you know, Sri Karo, look at this problem. It was with somewhat less credibility. So your point is exactly correct. And I think it's something that we've had to labor, uh, labor against. Um, we'll probably have to wrap up right around 7.30. So the last people standing are going to be the last ones to ask questions tonight. Okay. Over to you, Nick. Hi, my name is Nick Standish. I'm an undergraduate at here at Columbia and a participant in the Hertog Global Strategy Initiative. Um, my question regards, like, uh, um, government agencies such as the Nuclear Emergency Search Team, um, it seems as if the um, what is publicized in terms of successes or in terms of exercises, um, the public, for very good reasons, doesn't seem to see what um, protocols are in place and what sort of sensors we have at our borders and all these sorts of things. And I wonder if you could comment on the sort of dangers of maybe um, the unknowing for the American public in terms of what is already being done to combat nuclear terrorism and uh, uh, because uh, in your presentation you had the quotes of senior officials and uh, you commented saying that they are privy to all of these sorts of declassified information and if they're worried then we should also. I wonder if you could sort of uh, talk good, about that. Good, good point. So trying as a citizen on the basis of unclassified information to come to conclusions is, is complicated. That's a very good point. And there's absolutely no question that thousands of people working for the U.S. government get up and work very hard every day trying to reduce nuclear danger. And that they've been doing this for a long, long time, and especially since 1991 with Nunn Luger. So there's a big cooperative threat reduction program at Homeland Security. There's a, a BIMDO, the uh, uh, whatever, uh, you know, a, a, a unit that tries to build up homeland security capability against nuclear. Lots of people working extremely hard. The best way, I think, to try to do the net of it, though, is to see, or is to ask, what do the people who actually do have all this information, what do they regard as the bottom lines? And I, I think, it, just as I said, the bottom lines look worrisome, very worrisome, because even though we're running harder and working harder, if you're going the wrong way on an escalator, that, that's how it works. And the escalator may be speeding up. So we can work very hard, but I think 
North Korea is working pretty hard too. Or we can work very hard, but Al-Qaeda is working pretty hard. So we're working against intelligent, determined adversaries, as well as against technology, where the diffusion of knowledge is unstoppable, and the advance of technology is unstoppable. Most of that has a positive spin to it, but it also has an underbelly. So that's a good, it's a good question. Uh, and I'd say that uh, l looking at the judgments is probably the best, best uh, bottom line. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you have been talking about uh, these different programs of uh, disarmament. Can you speak a little louder or closer? Elimination. And then, uh, but at the same time, you have put this example of anyone who could like hide weapons of mass destruction or even try to produce. So I wanted to, th I was thinking about a combination of these kind of programs and uh, strategies, but at the same time, maybe the necessity to, uh, to combine with other measures, we should try to promote a democracy or um, another kind of processes um, in order to consolidate um, more stable regimes and to try to make these people uh, stop thinking that we are like enemies or like, so I, I wanted to, to listen to your view about these other solutions okay. or if no, 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 what's going on. It's a big, a big question, so I won't do justice, uh, since I haven't done justice to the other questions, I'm certainly not to this one. In the, the, the international relations, as you've learned in your course, consists of, uh, at least for the last however long, thousands of years, conflicts between states with conflicting interests, often with conflicting views of situations, uh, often with stereotypes, often with mistakes, often with confusion. The motivations that would lead a guy like Shazad, this fellow who was the Times Square bomber, living in Connecticut, to think he's going to take an SUV fill it full of some stuff, go into Times Square and blow it up? I don't know. Okay. I mean, I would say it's going to be a long time before all of those problems are erased. Indeed, if I take it closer to home, the Oklahoma City bomber was an American veteran. Wasn't particularly poor. Was living in Oklahoma City was just pissed at whatever, the world, and he fills his uh, truck with, uh, with bombs and kills 100, and, I can't remember, 170 you know, children. And, and this, so some percentage of people are gonna be fairly strange, I would say, for a long time. So I believe in the nuclear terrorism space, we need therefore to focus on the means more than the motive. So if we can deny a terrorist the means to achieve their deadliest aspirations, even if in their head they would like to kill four million people, well, they can't. So maybe they'll kill four, or maybe they'll kill 40. Now, that's not a very good, I mean, that's not the whole solution to the problem. Over time, one hopes that in normal societies, people have more opportunities, and fewer of them are crazy, or fewer of them are crazy enough to want to kill you know, somebody else. So I'd say that's the long-term aspiration. But the evolution of international relations to the point where people are not threatening and actually using force against other people, I think is, is, a, is a long, long agenda. But the agenda of preventing nuclear terrorism, I think, is, a, is, a, is an immediate agenda. So maybe with that one, I, uh, I should right. stop. Well, thank you so much, uh, Graham Allison. Thank you very much.